I have always tried to avoid direct conflicts. At least I tried not to bring things to a fight. I am used to solving any skirmishes with words, as I consider this to be the only and correct way out of the situation. But my opinion changed when Jeffrey Fletcher, a professional boxer, appeared in my life and wanted to take my wife away. Then I couldn't stand it anymore. My name is David Klein, and I want to share my story, which seems like it was taken from the most unexpected thriller, even though I always thought my life resembled a peaceful novel more. I grew up in a rather affluent family, which provided me with a head start not only in terms of material wealth, but also educationally. My education at Brown University was not just a step towards higher education. It was a journey that taught me to appreciate knowledge, perseverance, and, of course, friendship. Since graduating from university, I have managed to build the career I always dreamed of, and now I can say that I earn enough to indulge myself in any desire. I owned a luxurious home and drove a 2021 Audi. I wasn't the kind to throw money around. I was very economical and tried to live modestly to avoid attracting the attention of envious eyes. My father taught me to live by this principle because he had a difficult childhood and never wanted me to face the same. However, my attitude towards money changed with the arrival of a woman. My wife Kelly entered my life like a whirlwind two years ago, filling it with bright colors. Three weeks after we met, I proposed to her and introduced her to my parents. To put it mildly, my father was not thrilled. He thought I was rushing into things and that I could get seriously burned. But I always told him that I was a smart adult who could figure things out on my own. And eventually he backed off from us and allowed us to get married. Kelly was a very provocative woman. My expenses after the wedding multiplied. The amount I used to spend in a month was now gone in less than a week. But it didn't bother me. Kelly provided me with wonderful sex, raised my status among people, and overall, I felt very comfortable with her until two years into our marriage when this happened. It was an ordinary evening. I was returning home from a contemporary art exhibition where I had managed to acquire a couple of stunning paintings for our collection. As I drove past our house, my gaze caught something unusual. A black BM to be parked not far from our home. Driving past this car, it seemed to me that my wife was sitting inside. Puzzled, I approached closer and saw a scene that shattered my idyllic life. Kelly was kissing some muscular guy, and I later found out his name was Jeffrey Fletcher, and he was a professional boxer. Rage and disbelief overwhelmed me. They didn't even notice my approach. I opened the door on my wife's side and confronted them. Kelly, what does this mean? My voice trembled with emotion. They pulled away from each other, and Kelly, at a loss for words, remained silent, turning away from me. Jeffrey, in turn, got out of the car and stood in front of me. Leave, David. She's mine. His voice sounded threatening, and in his eyes I saw unwavering confidence. Listen, you overgrown musclehead. Are you confused? I tried to sound more threatening, but Jeffrey didn't respond. Instead, he silently landed a punch. I managed to stay on my feet and wanted to hit back, but it was foolish to go barehanded against a professional boxer. So he delivered a second punch to my face, from which I couldn't stand and fell to the ground. Pain and confusion made me lose my bearings. When I tried to get up, Kelly approached me, turned her head away, and handed me an envelope. These are the divorce papers, David. You have two days to sign, or it will be worse for you. Her words were cold and merciless. Yeah, we'll be waiting, buddy. And if you tell anyone, you'll only have yourself to blame for your death the musclehead said, and together with my wife, they got into the car and drove away into the night. I continued to lie on the ground, bleeding from my nose, utterly at a loss as to how this could have happened, and most importantly, why. I was very angry about the situation. I had never fought before, and no one had ever hit me. After a few minutes, I found the strength to stand up and entered the house, where surprisingly, everything was in its place. I tried to recall any slight indications, but nothing came to mind. Kelly was not working. She went to the gym, had massages three times, played tennis, went swimming, and often met with her friends. I realized I was in deep trouble, but I wasn't going to give up that easily. 
The first thing I did was call Anthony, my childhood friend. My voice trembled as I began to speak. Anthony, I need your help. Can you come over? Of course, David. I'll be there in half an hour, he replied, and I felt some relief knowing I wouldn't be alone with this problem. While my friend was on his way, I started to inspect the house and realized that of all the valuable things, Kelly had taken only her documents. Everything else was still in place. I also checked the safe. Kelly didn't know the safe's combination, but just to be sure, I decided to check. When Anthony arrived, I saw genuine concern in his eyes. We sat in the living room, and I began to tell him about everything that had happened 40 minutes ago. Each word was difficult for me to say, but I felt I had to get it off my chest. I came back home from the exhibition and saw them together in his car. They, they were kissing, Anthony. I barely held back my emotions. And then he beat me up, and Kelly, she just handed me the divorce papers. Anthony listened attentively, his face becoming more serious. David, this is madness. That bastard needs to be punished, he said decisively. I know, but how exactly? I don't want to go to the police, I confessed. First things first, you need to protect yourself and your interests, change the locks, block joint accounts, and consult a good lawyer. And maybe we should hire a private detective to find out what's really going on between her and this boxer. I think if a private detective can gather enough evidence, then your wife could be accused of marital infidelity, and you'll be in a much stronger position, Anthony suggested. I nodded in agreement. Anthony was right. I had time to secure myself. It was around seven in the evening. I immediately called my most trusted lawyer and told him everything that had happened, saying we needed to destroy those bastards who wanted to go against me, and his response was reassuring. But above all, I needed evidence of my wife's infidelity. I knew she was probably with her bodybuilder right now, so I asked my lawyer for the number of the best private detective. I can take on this job, but you must understand that there's little time, and there's a lot to be done. The private detective didn't finish his sentence as I said, I'll triple your fee. I'll get started, he replied, and I felt a bit relaxed. It was already late, so I decided to deal with blocking the accounts tomorrow. And tonight, I needed some moral rest. I had a truly wild morning. First, I called the banks and blocked all the joint accounts and cards that Kelly used, which belonged to me. Thankfully, following my father's advice, I was the one managing all our finances. Next, I changed the locks on our shared house and installed an alarm system so security could come if needed. I also called a team of four who within a couple of hours packed all of Kelly's belongings and placed them in large black bags outside. I'd managed to do all this in just half a day, and by evening I went to Anthony's place because I didn't want to stay home alone, and it felt unsafe. Staying with Anthony became my temporary refuge, a place where I could momentarily forget my troubles. In the evening, as Anthony and I were discussing what to do next, my phone suddenly rang. The screen showed Kelly's number. I hesitated before answering, but Anthony nodded, suggesting I pick it up. I pressed the answer button, and her voice filled the quiet room. David, have you lost your mind? Why can't I get into the house? And what's with our accounts? Her voice was angry and sharp. I sighed, trying to stay calm. Kelly, after what happened, I couldn't just sit back, and those accounts were not ours. They were mine. Who earns the money? Do you want a war? You'll get one. Her threats were so fierce that Anthony couldn't help but laugh. Kelly, please, let's discuss this calmly. I really want to understand what happened between us. I tried to de-escalate the situation. No, David, you've made your choice. Now let's see how you'll manage. I expect the documents by six o'clock tomorrow evening. She hung up, leaving me in complete astonishment. I felt bad because she was unwilling to have a conversation and instead chose to be aggressive, as if I had ruined her life, even though she had everything a girl her age could dream of. Ten minutes later, a message from a private detective arrived on my phone. He sent me the first piece of evidence he had gathered over the past day, including a video of my wife and a muscular guy in a car and over 15 photos of them kissing, hugging, and acting like a real couple. It was a shocking result.
I was surprised they flaunted their relationship openly, as she could no longer expect any fortune from me. I couldn't help myself and sent the photos to Kelly with a caption, still don't want to talk properly. Just a minute later, Kelly called me again, and this conversation turned out to be a real trial for me. Do you think you can blackmail me and get away with it? Her voice sounded so venomous over the phone that I immediately felt the tension. Kelly, I don't want any hostility. I just want to talk to you and understand what our problem is. I tried to explain, but she interrupted me. Talk. You blocked my cards and changed the locks. What about me? You're like a real rat spying on me. You're despicable and pathetic. Her voice was rising like a wave of anger ready to sweep everything in its path. And what am I supposed to do when you sick your oversized thug on me? I didn't want this to escalate into a confrontation. I tried to stay calm, but my heart was pounding wildly. Confrontation? David, you haven't seen a real confrontation yet. If you don't sign those documents and give me back access to the accounts and the house, I promise, you'll regret it. She paused for a second. You're a wimp, not a man. If you can't stand up for your wife, you can't even fight. What kind of protector are you? I closed my eyes for a moment, trying to gather my thoughts. Kelly, I'm recording this conversation. All your threats will be passed on to my lawyer, I said, trying to sound confident. There was a moment of silence, and then a stern male voice said, Tomorrow at six. I slowly put down the phone, feeling the weight of this conversation on my shoulders. Anthony, who had listened to the whole argument, silently walked up to me and put his hand on my shoulder. I'm shocked, dude. Where did you find such a snake? He said. And we both laughed, though laughter was far from our minds. I sent the call recording and the photos sent to me by the private detective to my lawyer, and he said it was excellent material. I couldn't resist and drank whiskey, although I never used to drink before. I started thinking about what to do tomorrow and how to be during the meeting. I was sure I wouldn't sign the documents and would file for divorce separately. My lawyer advised me not to go to the meeting, but to file for divorce in court right away, only now with evidence. But I was resentful and wanted to get revenge. After that conversation with Kelly, I realized that the game was just beginning. The next morning, I received a text message with the exact address. It was some neutral, deserted territory, which I was not comfortable with. Therefore, I suggested meeting at my house instead, and I received an agreement. I arrived at the location early, accompanied by three professional bodyguards whom Anthony had helped me find. They were big people in masks. I understood that my physical condition wouldn't instill fear, but three healthy men would certainly intimidate a boxer. We entered the house, my bodyguards hid in different corners of it. I turned off the alarm system and waited for Jeffrey and my wife. When Jeffrey arrived, I saw him carefully entering the house as if he was expecting some sort of trick, and he wasn't alone. Two of his friends were standing outside. I was at the other end of the living room, and when he started to approach me, I yelled, Stop! Let's keep our distance from each other. David, what's wrong? Are you afraid of something? He asked, continuing to move closer to me. I just want to talk, Jeffrey, honestly and openly, about Kelly, about you, and what happens next. By the way, where is Kelly? I replied. Kelly? Dude, she doesn't want to see you after what you did. You acted like a real rat, and what should be done with rats? He asked me. You should know better. It's not me who has a rat tail, I retorted, and he clearly didn't like my answer. His big head couldn't cope with the semantic load of my words. He started to seethe. Life teaches you nothing, he said, and shouted something to his guys who entered the house. I realized that the situation was heating up. But we can part peacefully and forget each other if you give me the signed divorce papers and the original photos you sent to Kelly yesterday, he said. Yes, no problem. I leaned down and slid him a folder with the documents across the floor. He picked it up, but on the divorce paper, in large letters across the page, the word loser was written. Ah, you scoundrel, he said, and confidently approached me. I had already signaled, and three of my protectors appeared in the room from different sides. You thought I was alone, huh? 
I told him, and ordered my bodyguards to properly teach these scoundrels a lesson. I didn't care about those two guys. I wanted Jeffrey to get what he deserved. Turns out he was much more cowardly because he was the first to tuck his rat tail and begged not to be touched. But it didn't help him. One of my bodyguards held Jeffrey, and in the meantime, I approached him. With the phrase, this is for daring to lay a hand on me. I hit him right in the face. This is for hitting me a second time when I wasn't showing any aggression towards you. I struck him a second time. This is for kissing my wife. This is for sleeping with my wife. This is for breaking into my house. I continued to beat him. He begged me to stop, but I felt no pity for him. Anger and resentment boiled inside me, accumulated over these past few days. I stopped and ordered that these three be loaded into a car and taken away to finish the matter. When my house was empty, I grabbed a mop and wiped the floor clean of the fight's traces, locked the door, and drove to my lawyer. I filed for divorce, attaching all the evidence of my wife's infidelity, including photos, video recordings, and voice recordings. I was determined not to back down and to see this through to the end. That evening, Kelly called me, her voice now calmer wanting to have a proper conversation. I hung up, not wishing to speak with trash, and texted her that she had two days to completely remove her things from the house or they would end up in the garbage. Two days later, I learned that Jeffrey was in the hospital, in a bad condition, with injuries to his arms and legs, looking as if he had been riding a bike and fell down a big hill. Officially, that was the case. I decided to visit my friend in the hospital to see how he was doing. I entered his room, and he flinched in fear. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to finish you off, I said calmly. Then what do you want? He asked. I just came to make sure our conflict is resolved. Peace. I extended my hand, mocking him as both his arms were in casts. It was evident he was seething with anger, but he couldn't do anything against me. Due to his injuries and foolish behavior, Jeffrey had cut off his path to professional boxing effectively ending his career since recovery from such injuries would take years of hard work. And even then, it wasn't guaranteed, but it was his choice, and I don't judge him. Peace, he said, and I shook his cast-covered hand. And one last thing. If I find out you're interacting with Kelly in any way, you won't be lying in a hospital bed, but in a wooden box deep underground. Maybe not even in a box, I said, and he just nodded in agreement. I left the hospital and headed to my home, which I was planning to sell. I had moved all my belongings out of it, and all that remained was waiting for the results of the legal process, which I was certain to win, and I had no doubts about it. Kelly continued her attempts to contact me, but I had no intention of communicating with her or interacting in any way. This person no longer existed for me. I was indifferent to her, understanding her motives and actions. She had started a relationship with me only for money, and I was blind. She found herself a new boyfriend because I was never of interest to her. She thought she could divorce me and take more than half of my assets, hoping I would let her go easily and give up what I had earned over many years. Remembering her threats and the audacious betrayal near our home, it becomes clear what kind of person she really is. Therefore, I even obtained a court order prohibiting Kelly from coming near me, as her threats were direct evidence that she could harm me. I didn't know what to expect from her. Two months later, we officially divorced. Kelly was accused of marital infidelity, threatening my health and fraud, which resulted in her having to pay me compensation. Since the house was purchased before our marriage, she had no ownership of it. However, the car I had gifted her for our wedding anniversary had to be sold, and the proceeds were split in half, part of which she spent on her lawyer and my compensation. As a result of all this, Kelly was left with nothing. She expected to gain everything from our marriage, but if she had been a bit smarter, perhaps she could have succeeded. Instead, she only embarrassed herself and showcased her level of intellect. Kelly had to return to the farm to her parents as she was left with nothing while I acquired new property, started engaging in sports to become more physically developed, and also listened to a whole lecture from my father, who did nothing but repeat the same phrase, I told you so. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories.
If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.